Listen, it's going to be an amazing day. We're going straight into it. You know what we do at Bookie's Place? We don't talk about the glitz or the glam. We talk about the necessary things that you guys need to do life and destiny. And we bring your favorite people. And today I have in the house the one and only Chief Dr. Dele Momodu. And he's in the building. Drum roll. <laughs> Hello, Bookie. Longest time. Wow. I know. Oh, so I good knew. to see you. I'm doing so very good. well. So good I'm to see fine. you too. Thank you, thank you. Wow, thank you, you see, so much. <laughs> you still look the same. You look exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. Uncle Dele, today is a packed day. So we're just jumping right into it. You know, welcome to Bookie's Place. And um, I'm going to tell you what we do at Bookie's Place. We don't talk about the glitz or the glam. We don't talk about the accolades the wins or the awards we talk about the grit and the grind the necessary ingredients that people need to do destiny in a world where it's so full of you know sham and facades we bring real people like you to talk about your experiences so that we can practically equip people to do destiny it's about ordinary people in their ordinary lives doing extraordinary things and to mention a few, you have ovation, you have ovation. Listen, there's, there's no need to even go into details. You are here to tell yourself how you went through the vicissitudes of life, you know. And that's what this show is about. So, welcome to Bookie's Place, Bob D. And when I turn this mic over to you, you're going to share your story, where you were born, and then you take it anywhere you flow to, we flow with you. So, welcome to Bookie's Place. Thank you very much, and I must thank you sincerely for inviting me. I'm used to interviewing people, so whenever I'm interviewed, I feel very honored. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. Okay, so you want me to speak about my life from the beginning? Yes. Okay. It's a long story, but I will try to summarize it as much as possible. Okay. Uh, of course, my full names are... Ayoba Midele, Abayomi, Ojutelegan, Ajani, Momodu. I was born in the ancient town of Ile Ife on May 16, 1960. Mm. Uh, to my parents, Pa Jacob and Gladys Momodu. Uh, my father had migrated from the old Midwestern region, now Edo State. To a lot of people don't ever believe that I have any ties to Edo State. But it isn't my fault. I was born in Ife, raised in Ife, spent nearly the first 28 years of my life in Ife. And uh, my father died when I was only 13. My mother is from Bogon, very close to Ife, about 15 minutes away from Ife. My father did not take us home. In those days, uh, there, there were superstitions about taking your young kids home. They believed in the concept of witchcraft that if they took me home, they might kill me. And I'm the only child of my mom for my dad. So I was overprotected. Uh, but I also remember that I was born into an Aladura church, the White Garment Church. And uh, there were prophecies about my life that mm. if I survived the first seven years, I'll be very famous and I'll be very great. As young as I was, I mean, that was already ingrained uh, in my system. Uh, it was drummed into my ears regularly that I will be very famous. Uh, mm. I still believe in prophecies. I believe that there are powerful men and women of God who can pray and make things happen. I also believe that I'm an incurable fatalist. I believe in destiny. Mm. Uh, we all work because we don't know what our destiny is all about. It's hidden. So I think God just didn't want men to stay idle, doing nothing. Otherwise, maybe we would have, if he told us in advance, then we will all know the direction to go. Uh, Having said that, I started education in Ife. I was barely six years old. In those days, to go to school, uh, you had to do something, get your right arm 
to go over your head and your hand must be able to touch your hair on the left. And then they will say, okay, you are now mature enough to go to school. In my own case, so my hand was not long enough. So the first headmaster rejected me. But there was another headmaster who was friendly enough. And I, that's part of my destiny. Mm. And he took me to his school. Uh, my school was a local school in Ilefe. It was so local that even the name of the school was Local Authority Primary School. <laughs> that's how local it was. Uh, but education was generally good in those days. It was a government-owned school. Uh, and from there, I, when I finished my primary school, I initially went to initial grammar school, which I didn't really like because it was far from home. I'd never left home in my life. So my parents were forced to bring me back to Ife. And then for the first year, I finished at Uluru High School, uh, wow. another local school in Ife. And then from there, I went to St. John's Grammar School in Ife in 1972. And I finished at St. John's in 1976. But let me tell you the sweet and sour. My story is sweet and sour. Mm. I didn't do well in my WIAC exam. I flung some of the most important uh, papers. So, but my mom was on letter. I mean, like, the person you will call an illiterate. She didn't go to school because it was not fashionable in, in those days for female children to go to school. So, but my mom insisted I must have education and asked me to go back. By that time, you know, I didn't have my dad. We couldn't afford to pay rent. So they had chucked us out of our home where we were living, you know. And we had to go and squat with our cousins in Modaike, the Oyemade. So we moved to their home. And then, so that was where I was living. Then I had to be an errand boy at a bookshop in Ilefe, CSS bookshops. I was, you know, uh, cleaning the floor, cleaning the bookshelves and stuff like that. But that was where I started developing interest in reading. If you look behind me, I've been, you know, a reader since I was young. I've been collecting books, any little money I had. I, I have some books there that are over 40 years old. I, and nobody can touch my books. My kids know that if you want any trouble, so that's why the most important place in this house, apart from the bedroom, is <laughs> my library. <laughs> you know, so... I, I, I knew the value of education. I knew that the only thing that would liberate my family from poverty would be education. So I did uh, the white again for a second time. Unfortunately, that was the year of the Odijo. That was the year when there was a mass leakage of exam papers. So they withheld some results, of, and I was one of them. I didn't cheat or anything, unfortunately. I was just unfortunate. I think at random, they just picked people. So my mom insisted again. I went a third time. You won't believe it. To go and do, and eventually I passed. But in between that, I was a village teacher. I was teaching in a remote village where vehicles could not ply the road. We had to jump on cocoa tractors. You won't believe it. You had to jump on cocoa tractors. You know what we call caterpillar in mm -hmm. those days to get to the village. But I'm the kind of person that throw me anywhere. I'll survive. I mm. quickly acclimatized. I was ready to be. I've always loved teaching. And people believe that I can communicate quite well. So, but when my mom came to visit me at the village, she was scared that you're going to die in this place. How do you live in this environment? I was living in the same room with the senior teacher. He had a bamboo bed. Me, I was sleeping on the mat on the, on the floor. So my mom insisted I must go back with her to Ife. So I came back and again, I, I would do my media job, just do bits and pieces, just to be able to help my mom. And eventually I got a job at the University of Ife Library, which again had to do with books. And that was where I got in, uh, introduced to the likes of Professor Walisha Inka, uh, Professor Wande Abimbola, Collier Motorshaw, Dr. Yemi Gubi, you know, all the, I mean, the big brains. In Ife at that time, Ife and I mean, of course, you you were in that environment, so you knew a bit about uh, Ife, you know. And uh, 
then my my brother my older brother had come from the u.s he he, he was a, a professor he retired as a professor at the department of physics uh, he came and i was living with him uh, initially we had a, an apartment lecturers used to actually have apartments in Fajui hall so wow. we wanted some lecturers to be close to the students so yes we had very beautiful i think it was a three bed apartment on three floors so we stayed there then later we moved to road nine you know so i lived for in road nine for almost 13 years with, with my brother and uh, so that was how i became a member of the university community i studied yoruba for my first degree we were the first set of jam in 1978 and yeah. i'm sure people might ask me why yoruba <laughs> i've always been a rebel i like to do things that are original i like to do things that i love I realized that everybody was doing law, doing medicine, doing the English language. But I wanted something different. I come from that background, that cultural background in Ilife. So, and I felt alarmed that if everybody runs away from studying our indigenous languages, then before you know it, our languages will just go extinct. So that was what drove me to you. But, but fortunately, if I operated a course unit system, so I was still doing other courses, in the Afghan studies, you would do history, do music, do philosophy, and so on and so forth. So that gave me a wide variety of subjects to do. And um, so by the time I finished that, I went on national service. I was teaching the level again. I was originally posted to Bauchi State. Mm -hmm. But for a man who studied Yoruba, what will he be doing in Bauchi? So Bauchi bounced me, but they rejected me. And then there was no option. They sent me back to Oyo State. Yeah. And then Oyo State said, okay, would you like to teach? Then they sent me to Oyo State College of Arts and Science, which was also in Ilefe. So you can imagine being born in Ilefe, doing all your education in Ilefe, then now doing national service in Ilefe. So I am almost totally tied to Ilefe, you know. And um, thereafter, uh, my life is a roller coaster. Things moved very quickly for me. I became a private secretary to the then Deputy Governor of Ondo State, Chief Akema Borewo. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, by the end of 1983, the Buari coup happened and terminated the Chagari government. So my boss, of course, was put in prison. All politicians were just put in prison indiscriminately. Whether you, mm -hmm. <laughs> you did wrong or did right, everybody, they just carried everybody out. So Buari put everybody in prison. Then by so, by 1985, I was fortunate, and then I got a job with the then only of Ife Obaokwandish, Dwade Elubushi II. I was managing Motel Royal and doing, you know, some runs for him at the time. Uh, so, but unknown to me, all these things were preparing me for what I'm doing today. Because that was how I was able to make a lot of contacts, a lot of connections. If you ask me my biggest asset today, it's my access. People you access know. is my biggest, yeah, it's people you know. Uh, I cannot open almost any doors. Again, mm. if you look at the way I am, I am non aligned. Everybody is my friend, but I will always mm. tell you the truth. So I'm neither PDP, I'm neither APC. I learned that from Obasujuade. Obasujuade was the closest to the Aula was, he was also the closest to the Shagaris. That was where I learned that from that don't get yourself because all these people leaders they all meet at the top some mm. today who are fighting against Buari, some will be fighting against Atiku. but you will realize that a lot of them they have how they meet when they meet and where they meet so mm. yes i never knew i was going to be a, a journalist i got i went back to ife to do a master's in literature i was mm -hmm. the first nigerian ever to do a first degree in Yoruba and a master's in English literature. I finished that in 1988, and I couldn't get a job. And that was what now drove me towards writing. So I started writing articles. I was writing for The Guardian in Lagos, writing for The Tribune in Ibadan. You know, Tribune was not paying me. Guardian was paying 25 naira per article, but I didn't mind. What can I do? So then I needed a job desperately because my mom... I mean, you know, the older you get, the weaker you become. So I was feeling guilty that I can't 
you know, just be hanging around doing nothing. Then a friend of mine, Unuka Bajino Yojo, of blessed memory, uh, then invited me to Lagos. I should try my luck at the Guardian. So I tried. I didn't get a job. Then he introduced me to the editor of African Concord magazine, which was owned by Chief Abiola, and I got a job on the spot. So that was how I became a negotiator, and I had to move to Lagos. And my life continued from there. Um, I spent two years exactly at Concord, and I had mm -hmm. very rapid and sporadic uh, promotions because, you know, when you are hungry, when you are poor, I tell people that what fires me up is the fear of poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, it is something that people must learn. The fear of, I see people complaining every day on social media. Uh, their life is too tough. Life was probably tougher for some of us. But that drove us to work like jackass. I worked so much that before long, everybody noticed me within the Concord uh, group of newspapers. Chief Abella had about eight different publications at the time. I was employed by African Concord initially, but I was writing for other papers. And I was not getting paid for those ones. But it made sure that I was very visible. Everybody mm -hmm. saw my byline by Dele Momodu. If they turned left by Dele Momodu, turned right by Dele Momodu. So within a few months, I was transferred to a new paper called Weekend Concord, uh, which was edited by uh, my boss, Mr. Mike Awu. If I was editor, uh, Mr. Dingba Igwe, also of blessed memory now, was the deputy. So they picked some of the best reporters within the Concord group, and I was one of them. So we moved to Weekend Concord. And there again, within two months, I was shining so much, I earned double promotion. From staff writer, I skipped senior staff writer, and I was appointed a literary editor. Six months after, again, I got under promotion, I became news editor. You know, it never happened. Six months after that, I resigned and joined Classic Magazine as editor, and I became the highest paid editor in Nigeria in 1990. I was exactly 30 years old at that time. And um, got so good, I spent about 16 months there before I decided to quit, and I was doing my own thing. Uh, later, I set up uh, a public relations outfit called Celebrities Goodwill Limited. Later again, uh, Mr. Anduka Baik Bena, the publisher of this day now, was setting up uh, this day, and I became the pioneer editor of what was called Leaders and Company at the time. But mm -hmm. again, by December of that year, 1992, I got married, and I thought, okay, I will just be an editor uh, for as long as it takes. Then, by January 1993, Chief Abiola decided to go into politics, and uh, he had already adopted me as his child, you know, from Concord. He liked me so much. So, of course, I had to follow him. The next thing, the election took place. Before I knew it, I was hauled into detention. I was in detention under the Babangida government. Then I came out. We were still fighting for the revalidation of June 12th election. Then Abacha came. Then Abiola himself was arrested. And we continued fighting. Then I was going to be arrested now by Abacha, and that was how I had to escape from Nigeria. So I ran away through the bush into Kotunu, uh, to Togo, then to Ghana. And I ended up spending three years in exile. I couldn't come back to Nigeria for three years until Abacha died and Chibabela died. So I think that's the story of my, my journey in a nutshell. Of course, a lot of things uh, have happened since then. But if you ask me, then I'll respond. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. It's a long story. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. It's a long and repeating story. Very, very long. Oh, and we're here for it. We're here for it. We're going to sit back <laughs> and stay <laughs> for fun. <laughs> because we want people to see. We live in a world where these kids are so entitled. They don't understand hard work. They don't understand that, yes, you said in your story that you were given a prophecy, but you still had to work it out. You didn't sit down at home saying, oh, that's no. You know, you have your part to play. So what is the part of a human being in destiny? I mean, they gave you... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, all you have to do is, for me, my trajectory and my recommendation always is you must start from preparation. 
-hmm. you can't achieve anything if you don't prepare so you must prepare okay. and when you prepare you will get what they call for example you, you serve apprenticeship if you're a tailor you go and learn how to sew so that's apprenticeship so everybody must pass through that process in my own case i believe everybody needs education mm -hmm. whether you are going to work with the certificate or not you must because education is not just about going to school and mm. writing exams and pass, passing your exams. No, education makes you a total human being, it makes you a consummate human being. So, and the cumulative effect of all the learning, all the knowledge will come handy for you. I, I that's the favorite example I give in music. Someone mm. like Black Baja, a lot of people don't know that Black Baja holds a master's degree. Mm. You understand? So, if you look at the business of music, Lagbaja has been extremely successful mm. because of that background. When you have a master's in business administration and things like that, there is no way the way you plan your life will not be different from an artist who just became famous, suddenly saw too much money, he will waste it all on booze, on smoke and on women that's why you will see a lot i mean you are in that industry a lot of artists have made incredible fortune but they couldn't hold on to it and that's because most times you are not able to go to school because of music most people go into music and it doesn't they are too busy to say they want to go to school so mm -hmm. education is a, a way of preparing for the future after preparation comes readiness. Then you are ready to conquer the world. Mm. By the time I finished my education, I knew I was ready to conquer the world. So when you are ready to conquer the world, then you now need sanity. You see, because you can do a lot of things normal, normal, until success comes. Mm. That's why they say it's easier to get to the top. It's not easier to remain on top. Maintain it, yeah. To, to maintain it. So maintenance is always a problem. So in my own case, I've been very fortunate because I grew up long enough in a rural setting in Ife. So by the time I got to Lagos, it was too late for me to become a negotiator. So I, I keep it real. I'm not going to pretend to you to have what I don't have. I mean, and I'm never rushing them. People don't know my story. You know, I tell people all the things that people are chasing. Look, some of my students, when I was teaching A level, imagine how many years ago I was teaching A levels. If I was 22, it means I was teaching A level 38 years ago. I was teaching A levels 38 years ago. Wow. Some of my students have built homes in Nikoyi, in Banana Island. It didn't bother me. I was building a brand. Because I know that for as long as my brand survives, I will survive. Mm. But if I rush into quick wealth and make quick money and blow it like that, that will be the end. That is why you see when the careless and what the rule of law, let our evenings be better than be our better morning. Than our, yeah. mm. Yes. Wow. So there is nothing as bad, as terrible as when your money was bright. But by mm. the time you are 40, you are already going down. I'm 60 now. And I can tell you, I've passed like 80 years into my 60 years on earth. But I still mm. feel like I can go back to school in Ife right now. And I'll be able to blend. Mm. The same thing wow. you are doing now, I'm doing it. I am very, very conversant with social media. There is no young man today who can bamboozle me on social media. It's not possible. <laughs> because what I, I, one of the things I learned from education is reinvention. Yes, yes. If you are not able to reinvent yourself, you are not likely to go far in life. Mm -hmm. So I'm always watching out. If you look around where I am now, if I show you around, you will see I'm surrounded by so much knowledge. Mm -hmm. I know what is happening in any part of the world. And God has also blessed me. Part of building my brand was to travel. That's another form of education. Education is not just about going to college. No. Mm -hmm. Education is about learning new things, meeting new people. For every new friend you make, 
if it's an Indian, you learn about India. In our own case, mm -hmm. I was able to learn from books. Before I ever went to Kenya, I knew about Kenya by reading Gugi Wazeongo, Whip No Child, A River mm -hmm. Between, Battles of Blood, Homecoming, and so on and so forth. Before I went to Ghana, I knew about Ghana by reading Naikoyama, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. Not yet why, born. Are we so, why are we so blessed? And, you know, and, and stuff like that. I read Kofi Awuno, This Earth, My Brother. So I knew about Nkuma. I read all the books written by Nkuma, Conscientiousism, Africa Must Unite. Before I went to Zambia, I read Kenneth Kaunda. You understand? Before I went to South Africa, I read Mandela. I, I read, you know. So my life is such that I am very, very good with knowing people, places, and events. And that's what innovation does. So you know, a lot of people don't know why I'm doing an innovation. They say, oh, it's, from, it's for rich people. Every publication must have a niche. Whether you want to focus on agriculture, you want to focus on automobiles, you want to focus on investigative journalism, you want mm. to focus on entertainment and lifestyle. So I chose entertainment and lifestyle. But a lot of people don't understand it. So when you do something, they say they are corrupt people you are, you are, you are promoting. No, you are reporting. It's not a promotion. If mm. I report a story, it does mm. not mean I believe in the story, but that's my job. It's mm. like a thief comes into a pharmacy and buys Panadol. And you say, why did you sell Panadol to that thief? That's not your job. Your job is to sell. You don't, you don't long ask. Long you are not going to hey, you are not going to ask for a certificate from the police that should I sell uh, to this man or should I answer? It's a business. Mm. Journalism is a business. Media is a business, and it is for anybody. But if I now do my story, and I now call someone that everybody knows is a thief, and I now write that it's not a thief, then I am liable. Mm. You, mm. you understand? So people will say, "Oh, why would you cover the story of the Abachas?" I must cover. Even if you kill my mother, I must cover. Mm. The only place I'm allowed to talk to people to criticize them is in my column. And that I do every Saturday. Tomorrow morning, if you buy this day newspaper, you will see me at the back page. I'm allowed to express my opinion. Mm. But once it is a story, it's a business. I must do my business. If your business does not survive and you are using your business to fight enemies, you will never have any business. Wow. Yeah. wow. A lot of people don't get that. It's something that I'm not sure if they teach you that in an MBA class, but I'm telling you as a practical, you know, uh, businessman, that business must survive. How it survives is nobody's business. You have the, everybody must have its own strategy. My strategy was to make sure that I am non-aligned. I report. If you go on my Instagram page, you see people abusing me. This morning, some people are abusing me. PDP has bought you. Why? Because I posted a cartoon in which they were teasing Ize Yamu in Edo State. But they did not, the same people, yesterday when I posted Ize Yamu speak, because they are now attacking their own candidate, then they are angry. But that's my job. My job is to report everybody. Mm -hmm. My job is to create fun. Look, mm -hmm. when I was supporting uh, Buari, mm -hmm. the Jonathan people, they drew cartoons and they put noodles in my head. What will you do? I, they said we were brainless. I took it in good faith. They did a cartoon of me, Nancy Rufai, and Bola Tinubu, three of us holding hands. And they were quoting all the places where we used to abuse Buhari. And they said, see them all, what has changed? That's politics. But mm. in Nigeria, everybody wants you to take their own position. And once you don't take it, and they see journalists as lambs of God who take away the sins of the earth. But we're not. We're business people. <laughs> we're not lambs of God. You know? So it, it's, it's a difficult task, but I've been able to navigate my way through knowledge. You, you must seek knowledge. Okay. Seek it first, knowledge, and everything else will be added onto it. Hey, remix. That's NIV version. <laughs> <Negro> <laughs> international version. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Dele, you talk about um, exile because all these things you're doing is what we do here you're talk talking about self-improvement self-development you talked about destiny you talked about purpose you talked about you know you um how to align yourself how to navigate difficult situations so when you were in exile 
What were you doing? Where did you go to and what were you doing? I was in England. and I was living in London. Uh, my wife and my first son came to join me. It was a very, very harrowing experience, but I will spare you that. Um, no, don't spare us. Please don't spare us. Tell us what to hear. So we, we had to leave uh, with our friends, the Olu lawyers, Benga and I, Olu lawyers. So we stayed with them for a couple of months. Uh, but like as I said, just like the story of what destiny means, mm. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had never worked in London. I never planned to live in London. I had multiple visas. That's why I could go easily. I had multiple visas to London, but I've never stayed more than three weeks in England. Okay? But getting to London, first month, second month, third month, so my cousin, Chekou Fatoye, then called me one day. I went to his house. Then he asked, say, ah, hey, you've been there for a while. What will you be doing? I said, I don't, I don't have an idea. He said, ah, no. If you're not careful, you become a security man. You may, you may even wash dead bodies, you know. And I said, no. I said, but you must think of something to do. That was how he planted the idea of a magazine into my head. That, but you were a good journalist back home. So why don't you start something? Then I reminded him of what my mom used to say. That money says, if it is not at home, let no man make plans in its absence. I saw in Yoruba. The first one is that you must never make plans in the absence of money because you need money for everything. The mm -hmm. other one is that mm -hmm. someone who has no money and says something soft will land. <laughs> the only thing that will land is that you, as you are vomiting, you are doing the other thing. <laughs> and that's cholera. <laughs> that you will just suffer for nothing. That's the summary of it. You know, so I told him, how are we going to raise money? He said, ah, but we must see what's chasing us before we start running. Mm. And that was how, yes, you must see what's chasing you before. So we did a business plan. And in the business plan, we needed uh, to raise about uh, 150,000 pounds. And here we are. So my uncle, Chief uh, Ezekiel Fatoye, had to scrape his account to be able to send us the initial 10,000. Wow. You know, yes, we did a few things here and there. We were able to sell a few rickety things. A few friends also supported us. And that was how we came to about 20,000 pounds. And this part will interest you. Imagine you needed 150. You have only about 20. How do you move forward? My bank manager at the National Westminster Bank at the time, a white lady, told me, so I went to her that to see if we could get uh, some loan. And she said no, because I didn't have a uh, credit history. You know credit history mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. living abroad. So I didn't have any credit history. So, but she could see the determination on my face. Then she said she can help me with an overdraft of 5,000. But overdraft means when you overdraw your account, then they can come in to help. So I had a partner who was supposed to join us on the project. A day to starting, he pulled out. He said, my ideas were too, too flamboyant that there's no way we can survive. I said, look, a man who is down fears no fall. My attitude to life is that when you are down, there is nothing to, there is nothing, sorry, I didn't know, I didn't put off my... Yes, oh, it's an ah. <laughs> Sorry, what's that mean? I'm live on here. I'll call you back. I'll call you back. Uh, yes, so. <laughs> Your <laughs> is very name. interesting. <laughs> I'm a local boy. I told you, I'm a local boy. <laughs> so, you know, it's an ewe. It's an ewe. Yes. So, what? Uh, I was saying is that he pulled out. He said my ideas were too fantastic. That and why did he say that? We had twenty thousand pounds, and here I was. I said we should spend fourteen thousand to go and get a beautiful office. Wow! Is that not crazy? Yes, I'm a risk taker. Mm. You see, my idea was simple, and this is something I want my viewers to take note of. 
my dear is if you don't have enough of what you need you must manage what you have and the way to manage it is to determine your priority area you cannot buy everything you are supposed to buy 10 things but here you are you have money maybe to buy two or four things scale of preference scale of, but in my own case i said let us buy just one thing and what was that thing image image making yes everything image. Image is everything. you see from my experience working with different rich people in the world i realized that no rich man would do business with a poor man mm. so it, a lot of people make mistakes when they are starting off they go to rich people with their proposal and they are announcing negatively confessing mm. negatively mm. that mm. ah sir mm. uh, we don't have money oh. we are looking on to the good lord though by the time you are saying that the man has tuned off immediately that does he do you think i'm a bank it happened to me once mm. i went to a to a deputy managing director of a top bank mm. when i had crisis in those days and the guy I said then please uh, we ran into difficulties please i need your help and man looked at me and said uh, who told me he was running the charity <laughs> that this is a bank if you need help go and put your application through the system so i have learned that early in life that people don't do business if you look poor you look unpresentable you see some people they want to go for an interview they are looking rough Mm, appearance. I'm telling you. So, I told my friend, let's go and get a beautiful office in Docklands. Mm. We were among the first three black companies in Docklands at the time. By the mm. water, you know. Yeah. A, yeah. Beautiful. Splendor. It's London. Yeah. So, it, it pulled out. But, what then happened? Anybody who was somebody visited that office. Mm. We started on a level that it was impossible for anybody to ignore us. Mm. Mm. It was impossible. Everybody started coming in. Then we started, look, by the time we started, the most expensive magazine in Nigeria was about 20 naira. Mm -hmm. We started at 150. People told me nobody will buy. I said, why won't they buy? I said, give them what they want. Let me see. And I, and I get you. Let me just... Because this one's wow. under, lock, under lock and key. There are not things that I... <laughs> <laughs> the very first copy of Ovation, I will show you. Wow. Yeah. I hope you guys are listening. Listen, you navigate with what you have you're as good as what you know you're a product of your focus and information differentiates the foolish from the wise okay so just keep your focus on what you want and don't settle for less mm -mm -mm. Look, we started, this is the very first issue of ovation magazine in 1996 so this magazine i'm holding now is over 24 years old wow. and you can still see the quality 24 years after Wow. You must never compromise on quality, whatever it will mm. take. Don't target another business theory I have. If you are doing a magazine of this nature, target only those who can afford it. Mm. If you are doing a newspaper, you can do go 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 for everybody. But if you are doing it and you want to maintain your standard, and who is the first person on the cover? That said the mood and the tone. That mm. is the owner of Harrods. Mm. Mm. That's mm. that daddy fire uh, that uh, Dodi Fayed's uh, dad. Yeah. yeah. The one that died with Princess Diana. That is yes. the yes. owner yes. of Harrods. That yeah. was him at the time. So we put the African king at Harrods. He's Egyptian, so he's an African. Mm -hmm. So yes. what that tells you is that one. We wanted an international brand. So we're not putting all our eggs in Nigeria. 
Then we did something very smart. We wrote a story, 100 Stormy Nigerian Women, and we get, gave a list of the top 100 women in Nigeria. So which meant that every woman who heard that her name was in the magazine will go and look for it. Yeah, wow. So it was a form of networking. Then we did the rising profile of South African women. So that takes us to South Africa. Now we have North Africa, Egypt. Now we have South Africa, down there. Then we had exclusive interview with Salif Keita. So you are going to Mali, you are going to all those parts of Africa. So that was how we started. And then wow. after that, we did a story on Somalia. If you look here, you will see a story on mm -hmm. Somalia. Mm -hmm. You know? So what we are trying to do is to make sure that we cover you know different parts of Africa. And wow. uh, the next one we did after that, I mean, look at what we started with. That's the advert from Harrods. That is the story from Harrods. Wow. And you can see the design. It's uncommon. Yeah. This is not the kind of yeah. thing that you will find in a regular magazine, mm. you know, in Africa. So that was how. Then we did stories on the billionaires, the the richest people in Africa. You can see MTO Abiola. Yeah. You can see him coming down from yeah. his plane. Yeah. From here on this side, you will see Tunde Fala Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So that's how we were attracting, you know, the creme de la creme of society. We had Onobiono, one of the richest people from uh, Cameroon. We had the Samba of the Gambia, Amadou Samba. You know, we later became yeah. friends. You know, and uh, when we launched Ovation, he was the one who sponsored it in, in the Gambia. So that was wow. how we started uh, the networking. Pro we had what we call property of the month and we went and secretly photographed Jimmy Lawa's house in London. You can see the building. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So it was an instant success. We, you know, some mm. magazines you will have to wait one year, two years before people begin to know about it. In our own case, and the first story we did on pastors, we went to Pastor Tude Bakari. You can see Pastor mm -hmm. Tude Bakari and his wife in the very first edition. Wow. Of the so from day one, we knew, we knew him and he knew us. We had Reverend Francis Wally Oke. Mm -hmm. We had Pastor Agu Iruku, who is oh, currently, wow. I go to his church, in the yeah. Jesus house, yeah, in Brent Cross. Yeah. We had him, yes. this is 24 years ago. I'm not wow. even sure you remember this story, you know? I'll so tell him, I'll day. tell him. <laughs> I'm yeah. telling him. Oh, as he go to his church. So, we did, we did a lot of stories. We had the story on Wura Biola. We had stories on... Uh, uh, Mrs. Kufori Jolubi, you can and look at the quality on paper. Look at mm. the quality 24 years 1996, ago. 1996, yeah. It's still, it is still there. We, we never compromised on that quality. As a matter of fact, we are now about 20 years with our current printers. Out of 24, we have not changed our printers in the last 20 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We haven't. And you did, Uncle Dini, you did all this in Exa. In exile, look at the next one is even more miraculous. This is seal, seal. The second issue of Ovation, also in 1996. This was the one that made us most famous globally. You know what happened? A lot of people thought seal was very hot at the time, so a lot of people thought it was a Jamaican or a Brazilian yeah. because you understand. So, only for them. To now see a magazine that spoke to his mother in Nigeria. His mom was living in Nigeria before she died. So we interviewed mm -hmm. his mom and we interviewed his sister, Sister Funola, both of them in Nigeria. So do you know what happened? Uh, National Enquirer circulates four million, was circulating four million copies every week in America. Mm -hmm. they, they called us and said they were interested in the story. How much would they pay? I said, no, don't worry about money. Just put ovation copyrights <laughs> so what <laughs> so what that meant was that we got free advert from a magazine circulating four million copies in america the globe contacted us the mirror in london contacted us that was how this magazine made us famous now we sent the first issue to harrods 
to the owner of Harrods. And he sent us a letter that I will never forget. Imagine a billionaire seeing a magazine and responding and thanking you for writing about you it. have the letter i'm telling you we we even we published it i will quickly it's a very short letter it, it titled wow. it an, an ovation for ovation Congrat <laughs> congratulations to you and your entire crew for the first edition of your magazine i was surprised and delighted to find myself on the cover of an of an edition entitled a celebration of africa i would never in a thousand years have thought of myself as the african king at harrods i've never aspired to be more than the high priest of retailing now mm. i shall have to raise my sides Francis <laughs> has always been one of my heroes and i shall endeavor to be as great a builder as that great pharaoh of egypt please accept my regard with all good wishes for the continued success of Ovation. Mohamed al Fayed, Chairman, Harrods, London. He sent us bottles of wine, champagne, chocolates, and everything. So that prepared us for the journey ahead. Wow. But it, it wasn't always rosy. So don't mm -hmm. let people now get it wrong. That because I said we succeeded at the beginning, it meant that it was... You see, life is a, is a graph. You go up, you come down. You go up, you come down. But with tenacity and sharp focus, and God on your side, you will keep going and coming. Like mm. Abiku, you go, you come. <laughs> and that is how we have wobbled along Hmm. in the last 24 years. There were wow. times people gave us up for dead. Till today, some people will still say, ah, Ovation, I want to now. But God did not allow it. Hmm. Because our friend, our, I refuse not to pass. We refuse hmm. to kill that dream. Hmm. Most people, what happens to them is that when they are doing something and money is not flowing again, immediately hmm. they think of, what else can I do? Mm. So you end up being master of nothing. Mm. Because all you are doing is trial by error, this and that. You will end up being a master of nothing. But God was so kind to us that we refused to give up. And again, I will tell you why. For you to do anything so passionately, your life must depend on it. Unless you find, I say it like this, Uncle Dele, until you find something to die for, you haven't started living. That's it. So your life must depend. My life depends on vision. I do you know how many people have resigned and gone in twenty-four years, but I had nowhere to go. Hmm. I'm the last man standing. You must be the last man standing in whatever you do. Hmm. Everybody else can desert you. You must not desert your dream. Mm. Mm. you must not desert your dream so that that has been the story of my life we had problems we had big problems bailiffs came one day the office that we were so proud of we could no longer afford to pay when the bills started pouring in we underrated the bills but they came eventually and the bailiffs came and there was a day they were banging the door and we were all inside the office we locked ourselves inside they said we know you are in there if you don't, if you don't open the door now, we are going to break down the door. I was saying to myself, break it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. And then eventually they got us out of the place to, so we took all our, that's why we don't have a lot of the additions because we lost so many things in the process of moving around. So we packed and took it to storage. We couldn't get money to retrieve our things from, we lost them. They will send wow. it back. We went to another office on Kilburn High Road. One day I got there, the empty the office, the bailiffs broke into the office and took away all our computers. We never got it wow. back. Wow. Wow. Amazing. But each time that happens, I will look at God. You didn't bring me to this world to fail. Mm. The, the show must go on. As they say, in the show must go on. 
whatever happens, the show must go on. And that's what has kept us till today. Mm. A lot of people don't know how we do it. A lot of people are envious. A lot of people will abuse me. Even your friends. Some friends will abuse you. Some people wage the war. Dele is promoting corruption. What is my offense? Somebody is doing wedding. You are Jonathan's daughter. You are doing wedding. So you, you invite Ovation to come and cover it. When I got there, Pastor Adiboye was officiating minister. Uh, Ali Baba was MC. The Banj was musician. Astoria was serving food. All I did was to carry camera and be showing what I did. That's you. my offense. Oh, that's my offense. <laughs> you see, because you captured the moment. How, how unreasonable human beings can be out of ignorance. Mm. You left everybody who participated in that wedding. You now grab the photographer. <laughs> so how would you have known what happened at the wedding if I didn't cover it? Mm. It's incredible. Mm. Till today is what I have to battle every time. Wow. People hate success. That's when I knew mm. people hate success. Yeah. And instead of sitting down to learn how did he do it? So that you can also learn something about how you two can do your own. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a magazine. There is a process to every business. Yes, yeah, process. Yes, yes. And the most ignorant people are the ones who come on social media and mm -hmm. talk as if they know. If you see the way Nigerians pontificate on social media, everybody is a thief except them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same man tomorrow, give him small power and see what he will do with it. Mm -hmm. Everybody wow. uh, in the last in, in the today in the last twelve hours go on my page and see people are busy at Jimobi this are they, some people say Ajimobi must have given me money. Ajimobi and I I never did any cobble, not one and people don't know me. <laughs> I'm able to do what I do, I'm able to write what I write, I'm able to stand shoulder to shoulder with leaders because I am not a scavenger. Mm -hmm. I don't go around like a beggar. When you see my pictures, you see a picture of a man who is contented with whatever God has done for him. I am not that kind of struggler. No. I respect people in authority. When I criticize you, I will not abuse you. When I interview you, I will report what you've said verbatim. I'm not going mm -hmm. to say because I disagree with you. No. I'm not a Bolekaja journalist. Mm. And I will never be. No. Mm. Wow. Wow. Because you've said so many key things. You've talked about parents. Perspective is everything. The reason why 419s will scam you is because they will come with private jets, with limo. And they don't have nothing. But your perspective yeah. just changes and you feel in your mind you put them on a pedestal. Wow. I was going to ask you a couple of questions, but as you were answering you and telling your story, you were answering the questions. You know, my lawyer in LA says, um, Shedma Luko says, Will Dylan Mamadu take venture capital money or sell the magazine? Never. I will, I will sell. No, definitely, I have to sell. I'm, I'm building up. Is it that's another thing? You can't rush into selling until you have good value on your shares. We mm. would have done it about six, seven years ago, I think. Mm. No, before then, before to, about 2010, that's about 10 years ago. UBA, we were doing something in partnership with UBA and we we're going to mm. do private placements. We will mm. do it ultimately by the grace of God, but we mm. have our plans. Our plan one is to make sure that the magazine stabilizes that we have achieved. We have an online newspaper called The Boss right now mm. and it's, it's picking up. Yeah. Then we have Ovation Television, and in the, in the next couple of weeks, we should have a platform that gives up 24-hour service. So we are, we'll be doing Ovation TV 24 hours. So from any part, oh, wow. people can sit down and enjoy. So mm. by the time you have all that, if you go to our investors, they can see that, okay, this is not a project that is going to fail. I mean, after 25, 26 years, they can mm. see the consistency that you are very serious about it. So you can, uh, you know, so if they allow me to continue as executive chairman because that helps. Mm. So what I've achieved is to build a double brand. That's why if you look at the, even the handle I use on the Instagram is Dele Momodu Ovation. It's okay. deliberate. 
it is for me to have a double brand. This morning, some people were saying, why don't you separate your brand from your personal? They don't understand it. I took it from Richard Branson. Richard Branson advertises all his own products. Is it when yeah. you've built a successful name? That successful name helps to propel your brand. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing. So we have a double brand and we hope by the grace of God we will now be able to tell, uh, turn that into mega box. But slow and steady wins the race. Yes. We, we will look for the best time and the best opportunity to offload and uh, allow people to participate in it. We have a lot of very good friends who we run to. I can see my childhood friend for Lady Shaking online. Good evening, Pastor. <laughs> we, will, we will run to him. He knows that Dele is not going to run away with his money. With his investment. So that's the thing. And Uncle Fola, so I'm coming to you. I'm Uncle Dele. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Dele. You know, you've said something, so many things. I mean, I can't even remember all of it, but as you were saying, they were just, you know, I was putting it in the corner of the We you have said, only three minutes. We have three minutes left. That's yeah. gone quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you said until you learn to reinvent yourself, you will never be a has been if you learn to reinvent yourself. And that is very key. A lot of people don't know how to flow with the time. I, I realized no. that when all this pandemic and all these things started happening, you quickly jumped in short before we started catching up. You had already, you know, <laughs> and that's what you you know and um, we just want to say thank you so much for coming to Bookie's Place give us like last words last words a future of ovation yes I'm just I'm just reading some of the comments here uh, there's someone who said the course of study no I said it already it's not what you study in university that will determine your success it, the, the university prepares you for the vicissitudes of life yes. the university prepares you for any eventuality you know how to adapt to the situation and that's what i've done anytime yeah. i find myself at a dead spot i know if i'm not able to turn back i have to break some walls break you have to break, break the fence you have mm. to break the barriers and mm. that is the thing and i will say it in yoruba finally and it's my dear, oh, you know, a pata to go to work when no ake. That's it. Yes, you you have to be tough because life itself was created to be like that. Wow. And, uh, so I thank everybody. I thank you, Buki. I brought me at that time. Thank you. So good to see you again after so many years. I good know, I know, I know. Thank you so much. I wish we had thank more you. time, but thank you so much for everything you do for who no. you have been. Your role Thank model you. works because Thank if you. you're not slowing down, waiting can concern us to be slowing down. Uh, you know, I, can't, I, can't, I can't afford to slow down. No. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief, Chief uh, uh, Williams, wrote me Williams, was he going to court when he was about 80? He didn't wow. slow down. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 I, I can't. Uh, there is Lord Denny. I was reading about Lord Denny in, uh, in law. You know, I'm surrounded by a lot of lawyers. It, it, it didn't slow down. Those are mm -hmm. my own. Chief Commander Benizal Abe is still singing. He's mm. already approaching 80. King mm. Sonia Day is still performing, dancing. Who am I to say I'm tired at 60? No. By the amen. grace of God, and amen. God, 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 we're just starting. By the grace of God. Amen and amen. My sister yes. says how. Thank you so much ah. for coming to Bookie's Place. Thank you guys. My Check pleasure. out the episodes on Bookie's Place on YouTube. Subscribe and watch the other episodes with everybody else. Chief Dr. Gary Kamadi, everybody. <laughs> So thank, you. Thank, you. Night. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you thank next you. week.